Next, we're going to jump right into the data analytics for better underwriting panel. We are fortunate to have our own good friend, Audrey Rampanelli, to moderate today. Audrey is the CEO of OnRamp Risk, a senior risk executive and corporate officer with an extensive background in risk management, insurance, and alternative risk practices. I'm also very excited today to hear from our three underwriting panelists. Collectively, they've got over 70 years experience in insurance and underwriting. First, we're going to start it off with Tarab Hussein, who is the chief actuary at Partner Re. Tarab has spent over 20 years as an actuary at the Hartford Arch Insurance and Munich Re. Next, we have Karen Rudd. She is the VP and head of disability underwriting for Guardian Life. She has over 20 years of experience as a life and disability underwriter. And our third panelist today, we have Todd Russell, who is the co-founder and chief customer acquisition officer at E2 Value, one of our sponsors. So thank you, Todd. They provide property valuation solutions and consulting while valuing some of the world's most beautiful homes and antique buildings. Thank you for all being here today and I'll send it over to Audrey. Terrific, thanks Brett. Sure. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so data. Data is said to be the new oil, but what's happened in the commodities markets recently, I think that ship sailed. So I really think that data is the new gold, but the quantitative and qualitative aspects of the data make all the difference, where it's sourced, how it's incorporated into underwriting models and how it impacts the output. And whether in PC lines or in life insurance, data analytic capabilities and output are the real distinctions. So Karen, let's start with the source, the data source. What proportion of your disability underwriting is sourced in-house versus externally? And what about the cost of third-party data? Great question. So thank you first for having me here, I appreciate it. So I would say that excluding our own actuarial data, um, for DI purposes, and I'm actually a DI underwriter for, for a real long time, uh, we use external sources of data in everything that we do. Every fully written, underwritten case that we write, we have some kind of external source of data that we use. And I know that I was asked to speak about the cost, the average cost that, these co that, that it takes on, but I can't really compare the cost of data to the cost. It, it is, you know, yeah, if you look at ordering, a medical exam for us, if you look at ordering medical records, even if you look at ordering a lab test, I'm looking at this from what can we gain with the data so that we don't have to go in and do that. And I feel like the, the there's, it's more than comparable when you look at the way we, uh, when you look at the way we get the information from the data and we get it instantly instead of waiting for weeks and months. And this way we can be more proactive and be more client friendly and we can, you know, like with everybody, the customer experience is what's most important for the for most insurance carriers right now, and us included. So I'm looking at this cost of data and the experience is just being something we do quickly and accurately. So I think that's the most important thing for us. Terrific, thanks. And Tarab, uh, what lines of businesses do you feel have the most depth of data and which have the least? Sure. Thank you, Audrey, for the question, and and you know, thank you also everyone for the opportunity and uh, letting me letting me speak here. So when it comes to data, you know, I think rather than thinking about it specifically in terms of you know lines of business, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut the question up in a little bit. So I'm gonna start with talking a little bit about where there's the actual insurance data that already exists within the various insurance carriers and reinsurance companies, and this is not going to be a surprise to anyone. I mean, most of that data sits within the personal line space around homeowners and personal auto. And as you move into the commercial line space, it, it gets, uh, uh, there's, there's less and less data as you go up the food chain and up the food chain means from small, middle to large and ultimately to specialty lines. And as, as you, tr you know, transcend across that space, you get less and less data. So when it comes to uh, how you supplement that with third party data or how you can create your own data, that's where it becomes a little more creative and interesting. So I think, you know, the opportunity is really about trying to assess uh, the lines of business you're working in and where you have perceived gaps or have a gap in your data or understanding of the exposure. Mm -hmm. And you can look to get third party data. So an, 
An example from back in the day would be like FICO scores. That would be a good proxy and measure for certain personal lines. Uh, and then in ways more recently and in a more contemporary way of how to create and build your own data, companies have gone down the path of using things like telematics or wearables and even going uh, to drones and drone technology to, to try to you know, canvas literally uh, space and time and, and look to build their own databases that way and, and capture data. Great. And now, Todd, you've been providing insurers with data for 20 years. What should insurers consider when expanding their third-party data partner lists? Thanks, Audrey. Again, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it being a part of InsurTech New York. Um, you know, I'm going to tell a joke first, if that's okay. The good thing is I can't hear anybody groan, so it'll work out well. Um, so there's a lumberjack, and the lumberjack uses a handsaw to cut down the trees. Um, and a chainsaw salesperson comes by and says, look, I've got this chainsaw. You can do 200 times more work with this chainsaw than the handsaw. So I'm going to give you this. You tell me how it works out. If you don't like it, bring it back. So the lumberjack loves it, takes the chainsaw, excited to go to work the next day. And to the lumberjack's mind, he didn't like what was happening. He didn't like the chainsaw. He thought it was terrible. And he was working way harder, and it wasn't doing the job. So the next week, he comes in the shop. He's very angry. And he says, just take this piece of junk back, because I barely cut half as much wood with this thing that I did with my old trusty handsaw. So the, the uh, sales clerk was a little concerned, because it's pretty obvious the chainsaw is going to be better than the handsaw. And so they says, come on back in the shop. We'll take a look and see what's going on. So he checks the uh, gas, he checks the oil, and then he starts it up. And of course, it makes a lot of noise and it's running and the lumberjack goes, uh, hey, what's that noise? And uh, the joke being that the lumberjack, you know, used the chainsaw like his handsaw. And I think the, the part about third party data is very interesting, the TED talk we just had, and you know, the discussion we'll have here is that you know it's the third party data what can you do with that third party data but also how are you going to approach it how are you going to change your process are you going to use it like a handsaw are you going to use it like it's meant to be used i will still think that uh, take you up that oil is valuable and i think oil and data you know data is the gold or oil of this but if you said to john d rockefeller you know i want to give you another oil well i think he would say yes and I think that uh, if you said, could I give you more money? And I think he would say yes. So to me, data is like giving more oil or uh, money to John D. Rockefeller uh, in that process. But the one thing that made oil valuable is it was connected to the internal combustion engine. It wasn't just oil by itself. Oil helped fuel the internal combustion engine, which in turn fueled the oil. And I think if you look at it as sort of one approach, and I like what Tarab said about, you know, the multi-layered approach to that piece, I think you have to look at it, what you're going to do with it and how you're going to use it. I think also back to the important point about time and the point about being able to use the data quickly. But still, in my mind, there's not enough data out there that a carrier can't have or use one way or another. And I think that... Um, I guess another side of this is how are they going to use it? Are, they, are their hands tied by the system that they have? Are their hands tied by their thought process? Um, but at the end of the day, if you just keep putting more data in, in, a, in, a, in a product that is driven by data, money is made by how well you use the data, that you should use as much data as possible in that process. Hmm. Okay. Now, Tarab, um, what do you think the main challenges are in adding additional data to underwriting models? And, and how have you overcome those challenges? Sure, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Todd's analogy of the, uh, the lumberjack. So, you know, you can have a lumberjack and you can give him a chainsaw and once he figures out how to use it properly, that's great. But then if you give him a second chainsaw, he's got a second hand, so maybe he'll be able to be somewhat productive with it. When you give him the third one, you know, he's probably gonna end up in hospital. So more is not always better. And I think when it comes to data, I think the uh, similar approach could also be taken. So just because you're, you're getting more data doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be better. The focus should always be on the marginal benefit because you want to avoid duplication. You want to avoid irrelevant data. You don't want to just add things on for the sake of adding it on. So I think if, if you, know, you take a step back 
and use more statistical tests and, and go back to basic principles of statistics, there are goodness of fit tests that are out there. So any of us who've studied stats uh, over the years uh, will know of some of these tests. And I think that's really what we as uh, professionals in this space uh, can look to apply some of that logic to say, okay, let's be careful of these false positives. Let's understand them and use some of the statistical tools and techniques to say, if I add you know, this additional data on, does the model fit better? Or is it, does the data fit the model better? Or does it make the result more intuitive? Does it make it better from a statistical perspective? And I think that will go a long way because I think you know, if you do things in a fact-based way and use statistics and data to guide some of those, some of those decision-making uh, items, then you're going to find that you're going to get better buy-in, better success, and more favorable outcomes. Hmm. And shifting into how or if it, this can accelerate underwriting and, and reducing time to quote, Karen, um, is Guardian using any processes for accelerated underwriting? And if so, for what lines? So and we definitely do. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, how could analytic, it's a two-part question. Uh, how could analytic tools help in this process? Sure. Great question. So for our, our life side, we definitely have an accelerated program in place. We had been piloting for the DI side. Uh, we've been piloting with a few different carriers or different vendors, some um, stuff last year. And we just got ready to roll out and signed contracts this year, right about the time that COVID-19 hit. So you can imagine the panic that hit because we were trying to get lab tests and nobody would let, nobody would go to a person's house to get a lab test. But we had this analytics stuff that we would be able to use and roll out at the end of March. So for us, it allowed us, we do it with every case. We use the analytics that we have with every case, the data that we have. It allowed us to seamlessly change the way we underwrote. So we did not need to get those labs that we had. So now we would get labs on individuals that were 18 to 60 for DI purposes and older for life. And both of us were able for life and DI, we were both able to just seamlessly pivot and not get those. We also, uh, we had issues with getting medical records and we were seamlessly able to do something completely different just by the fact that we had implemented some programs. So it made us not lose a beat. In fact, we're busier than we've probably ever been. And I can't say enough for the fact that we would not be in that position had we not started doing some of these pilots. So for DI, we're using it in all cases, but we are definitely looking into the future to start doing some more uh, streamline approaches where we can do some segment of our business and underwrite that uh, either straight through processing or in an automated fashion. And that's going to help us tremendously. Hmm. And, and to Rob, uh, what analytic tools can reinsurers use to reduce the time for quoting? Um, I'm sure. No, that's a, that's a good question. And I think, you know, with, with, uh, with partner re being a pure play reinsurer, you know, we have to really be, be mindful of this and, uh, and we're playing in both the life and the non-life space. So the complexities can be, can be quite intense. And you know, reducing the quote time or getting a quote out quickly is important, but I think you know, at the end of the day, you, know, you wanna think about, it's not just about the reduction of the time, it's also about making a more informed decision. So with, with all the conversation about data and everything it can provide us it, and, and technology and analytics and tools like that, Yes, we can come back to, to the table with a faster quote, but it should also be a more informed decision. So, you know, in addition to uh, just the speed, you know, two things I do look for are, are benchmarks and also consistency. Benchmarks I find, you know, third-party data can be helpful in, in terms of being able to provide me with a benchmark. It could be macro uh, information that's publicly available. It could be something that uh, in my prior time as a, as a primary company actuary, I would have used uh, certain third-party sources to get some some data and use that to benchmark but benchmarking is just a, a good core discipline to have and then once you've been rooted and measured against some kind of a benchmark you can then look for consistency and by that you know i'll give an example of what we've done at partnery on the non-life side is we've launched and created a, a single consistent global platform for non-life pricing and what that does is it basically enables uh, the user to take advantage of technology, to do things in a quicker, faster, better fashion, 
and also intake more data and do more robust analysis. Uh, so at the end of the day, when you combine that with the ability to do some third party data for benchmarking, you're in a situation where you're being able to make a more informed decision and ideally also coming back uh, to the client in a, in a quicker and faster fashion. And Todd, what, about, what are your thoughts? I mean, from a PNC carrier perspective, how, how can carriers reduce time uh, to quote using analytical tools? Well, I think that the, um, I think, and I'll go back to the original question, can you use that third party data? Can you bring those other pieces in? Mm -hmm. And I think that there is enough information available. And I think Tara mentioned about the, the data available in personal lines. And so we'll stick in the personal lines world first. And I think that in personal lines, there's a tremendous amount of data that could be used that back to my point about, you know, if you try to use the handsaw, it's probably not going to be the best fit. But if you, again, do the analytics, do the process, you could, you know, I, I personally, and I, you know, I can have a very slanted view in this, um, but I'm not sure why you have to ask a lot of questions to ensure a home or most homes or why you have to ask a lot of questions to ensure, um, you know, especially an apartment or a renter's insurance. There's just, you know, to me, there's enough information you can fill that in. I think like the next step for small SMEs, you know, small, medium-sized businesses, uh, there is less data um, in that world, but I still think you could use the data that's available to cut down on the process. I mean, a few years ago, it might have been eight years ago or so, you know, we were out in the lead generation space, and for a client to get an online quote back then, they had to fill out about 65 questions online, and it wasn't going well, and it wasn't going well because who's going to answer 65 questions except somebody that really, really needs insurance and will sit and answer 65 questions and probably two were answered correctly. And so they would have to go to another data source to verify those answers. So I think that in removing, you know, those obstacles, you'll get to the three or four or maybe six or whatever it turns out to be for your particular group, the number of elements that make all the difference. And a lot of carriers have looked at, you know, the questions they've asked, and how many, you know, do they need, really need at the end of the day? And if you have three question underwriting now, three questions, you get a quote and they write your house. That's amazing. Um, now, you know, when we look at different analytical tools and what happens with data, obviously artificial intelligence becomes a big discussion point and, and how it's ingrained into the process. And also, you know, the concerns about um, when you use AI, particularly in underwriting models, how and does it introduce bias? Tarab, do you wanna kick us off with that one? Sure, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. And sure. yeah, it's funny, every time I hear, um, every time I hear uh, artificial intelligence, you know, I, I oftentimes just think, you know, we as an industry, uh, sometimes maybe just need to focus on just intelligence and uh, we can we can get to the artificial part of it later but I think you know the the intelligence piece is super important and for me you know um, the the idea of bias and, and generating bias is something that uh, can can easily happen and we have to be mindful of it and as I mentioned in my earlier part you know there are ways that you can you can go about that through having you know, different uh, statistical techniques that you would use and, and be able to, you know, make sure that you can, you know, ensure that the models you're building, the tools that you're using are fit for purpose, are fit for the right use. And I think a lot of that has to come down to, you know, the governance and controls you would put around your processes and how you structure and, uh, and go about your, your, uh, your modeling and your tool building and analytic capabilities. But I think there is, a, there is a concern there about having some of these false positives and biases in the data. And um, there's no easy answer to all of that. Yeah. And, and I guess too, because when you build algorithms, you know, you've got a group building them. And then I had just an interesting conversation with an actuary not too long ago about, well, you know, when, when you have the output of um, modeling, when it's done through AI, um, she was very uncomfortable with the output because she didn't know the calculations, whereas the way actuarial work was done before, she would 
create the model, work the data, understand all of the processes. And so she had confidence in the output. Um, so Todd, you know, th yes, the concern is, is there bias introduced, but also how do you deal with the comfort level and the confidence with the output? Thanks, Audrey. Um, well, I think, first of all, I want to thank my friends at InsureTech New York for the sniffy mug that they sent along, because that's, that's really special. So thanks, Tony. And, uh, but I think that there's, I, I think, you know, that Tarab mentioned a good point. I think your, your friend has that concern and a good point, but I think, you know, sticking with the intelligence versus the artificial part, and I think there are layers of artificial intelligence. You know, you could be, you know, from the Terminator, um, you know, people think of artificial intelligence at one end um, uh, to, you know, it's, it's a very simple algorithmic process. And I think there's bias in a lot of things. You know, the, the bias in, um, you know, in redlining was int is introduced in the 70s when they put the uh, regulations in around not redlining. And so that goes a long time ago. So I think that that bias could be there, but I think to Tarab's point, and, and realistically to your friend's point, the, you know, it's very simple to test and not test the, you know, the bias or the process or how a particular um, algorithm is working. And if it is learning and if it's moving, I think that the thing people get stuck in and, and humans get stuck in is that it, it depends on what the cost is. And I mentioned you know, like Netflix uses AI, Amazon uses AI, but the decision, you know, if, if Netflix recommends the wrong movie for you, you know, the, the threshold is really not that big of a deal. It's not that much of a cost. Mm -hmm. But if you're introducing bias, like we mentioned, if you're introducing something that, you know, damages the reputation, damages, you know, perhaps people's um, finances in that process, that's where you want to ramp up the testing and the, and the processes there. But I also, I do get a little chuckle out of someone saying, well, I don't understand that particular um, process. And I think that's okay. I think people need to be comfortable with the idea they may not understand. I mean, I don't understand how Microsoft Word works, but I use it, I know it works. But again, that threshold of pain, if it doesn't work well, is pretty low. Um, and I think that, you know, there's also the idea that, you know, a person might be able to think of five things or 10 things or seven things at once, and we'll give them that, but maybe it was one thing at once, where the computer, you know, one of the things we, we have, we work with Willis Towers Watson on a structure score, and we introduce that. And, you know, the computer's looking at, you know, hundreds of variables over millions of risks. And humans just can't do it. So it's, it's not a question of do I trust that? It's just a question of there's no other way to do that process. And I think you can trust science. I believe that. Um, and I believe there's simple ways to test those pieces as they come out. And I think that bias can be introduced just like anti-bias can be introduced. And it's not necessarily an algorithm that's gonna put it in there. Hmm. And to Rob, regulators um, getting involved with the process, how do you explain to the regulators the elements of proprietary black box type models that use advanced analytic techniques? Sure. That's an excellent question, and uh, it's one that, um, you know, fortunately the industry has been faced with for, for a couple of decades now, a few decades, because when the first round of CAT models were introduced after Hurricane Andrew, RMS was formed, and then, you know, they used their, um, their, their scientific techniques and, and uh, built these sophisticated models, which then had to go to all the regulators to get them comfortable. It took, took a while. And so I think, you know, as, as companies think through um, models that they're building that have that black box nature and capability to them, you know, look back to the learnings that the industry has been able to, to form and take those and apply those into the way they're dealing with their regulators. It could be, and, you know, it's not going to be a one size fits all. So different uh, regulator in the U.S., you have different states. So different regulators may have different approaches. Some may want um, written documentation, some may want to have a, a conversation, but I think there's an opportunity here as well for us uh, to educate and inform, uh, as well as just say, here's what I want to do and here's how I'm going to do it. So there's no, like I said, no one size fits all solution. I think we have to learn from the past and we have had experiences and we can remind the regulators that, you know, this has been done in the past and um, there, there's no harm. In, in having that dialogue and having, having an open dialogue with the regulator as well. I think they would welcome that. 
So we have about four minutes left to our session. And the one thing we'd love to do is always give some good takeaways for the audience. So what can the audience practically do in the next 90, 120 days to improve their underwriting using data and analytics? Karen, do you want to take that one first? I'm happy to. So my answer is really simple. I think that we should just be open to conversations with vendors. I think that insurance carriers should be open to pilots, see what they have to offer. And if you've looked at one before, look at them again, because there's so much technology that we're just learning more every day. And to be honest, that's how I've learned to do, that's how we've become where we are in underwriting for us, just by going to all of these things and learning more and building on our, our experience and listening to you guys today is phenomenal. So thank you. Great, Tarab. So uh, I'll just say very quickly. I mean, you know, take risks, right? That that to me is uh, is one thing we should be thinking about. And this is me speaking on my employer. Um, but you know, if you asked you know Henry Ford when he came out with his car, you you know that people were asking him why did you build a car and everything, and he goes, you know, why don't you ask the people what they need? He goes, why well, would I ask the people what they need? If I ask the people what they need, they tell me they want faster horses. So. I think, you know, thinking outside of the box, take a risk, making sure you have all the different stakeholders uh, involved in the conversation, have a problem statement. So know what you're trying to solve for and then work towards a solution, but be comfortable going outside of the box. And to Karen's point, you know, vendors um, have, have potential solutions, speak to them and, and learn from them. Don't be afraid of the pilots, as she said, but uh, be creative, think outside of the box, take risks, and uh, don't just look for a faster horse. Great advice. And Todd, do you want to? Take I'm just going to add that it, you know, Karen is my favorite person because she said to talk to vendors and being a vendor. <laughs> uh, I think in the, in the next, really, if you think back, what were you doing 90 days ago? The reason we're on video is because the world changed 90 days ago and you know, we, we had to go to the office. We had to do these things were certain mantras that folks had and it turned out not to be the case. So I think I might embrace with all due reverence to the situation we're in and, and how this is affecting people. But this is a great chance to kind of figure out what else could I throw away in the next 30 days or 60 days and call your favorite vendor along the way. <laughs> Terrific. Well, let's see, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Um, no, actually, well, quiet audience. Um, well, we have one minute. So to wrap this up, um, any last thoughts on data analytics in the underwriting world uh, for the audience? Um, anyone wanna have some last words? I'll jump in real quick with last words. Thank you, Audrey, you did a great job and I appreciate it. We're getting just to the wire. <laughs> Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, and I think with that, we've wrapped up on time. So look at that, very punctual. Well, thank you, Todd, to Rob, Karen. It was a great question. I appreciate the time and all of the insights. And we will now pass the baton back to uh, Brett and the InsurTech New York team. Thank you. Good job, everyone. And thanks for sharing all of your experiences and, and some of your uh, valuable insights. And, once again, a fantastic job, Audrey. Thanks for contributing today.